Namaskar. In this episode of Dil Se, we're going to talk about a highly sensitive subject. Sensitive, why? Because Indo-Canadian relations have taken such a downturn because of certain allegations made, not just by the Canadians, but also by the United States of America. And there is an element of hypocrisy in that. Now, what is that hypocrisy? We've known in the past how the United States and many other countries have forayed across borders, picked up people, brought them into their own country, and prosecuted them. We've also known of instances where they've gone outside the boundaries of their own country and done things about which they make allegations against us. But the geopolitical situation has changed. Before the Cold War, of course, India was extremely close to, the, to Russia. And at that point in time, our relations with Canada, even though uh, both of our countries were um, part of the colonial empire, even though we respected each other, but the relations were not that good. And if I remember correctly, in 1948, uh, Canada uh, said there should be plebiscite in Kashmir. So throughout the wild Cold War, Pokhran won, uh, Canada opposed it, naturally the West opposed it, Pokhran too as well. So when the economy opened up and the Cold War was over, the situation changed. The situation changed, why? Because our economy became more liberal, we have open borders, uh, people who come and invest, which was not so prior to what Narsim Rauji decided. And so the situation globally had changed. And the best period in our relationship with Canada, I think, was between nine to 2006 and 2015, uh, when our relations were on the upswing. Then recently, and I'm talking about very recently, in 2023 and now 2024, things have taken a downturn. Now, there are two aspects to it, and we're going to discuss this at great length. One, that the Sikh community in Canada is about uh, 2%. Uh, there were about 770,000 Sikhs in Canada, uh, and their representation in Parliament, Canadian Parliament, is 4%. And this, with the collaboration with the minority government of Trudeau, which is the NDP, uh, of which a Sikh is a leader, uh, the Canadians rely upon the minority community to win in some areas, and therefore they pander uh, to their concerns. The other problem is that India has had a lot of problems with separatists in Canada. And we know how in 1984 and in the 1980s, how they supported the separatist movement. And even as recently as the farmers' agitation, they were supporting the farmers' agitation. And India is extremely peeved about that, and we've been telling them that, look, there are X number of about 20, over 25 extradition requests that we have made, and they don't take, take them further. So in this context, uh, what is the situation on the ground, how it's going to play out, and how India-Canadian relations and India relations with what are called the quote-unquote five eyes, how they're going to play out are matters which you're going to discuss today. And we have three extraordinary people here with me. One is Manish Tiwari, an old friend of mine. Um, he did his law from uh, Delhi University. He did a bachelor's from Punjab University. His father was a renowned, renowned author of Punjabi language. Unfortunately, one fine morning way back, uh, the terrorists assassinated him. Uh, it was a real tragedy. His mother was a professor at the uh, institute uh, in Chandigarh. And uh, he's been a member of parliament now, and this is the third time. First from Ludhiana, uh, thereafter from uh, Anandpur, Sahib. Anandpur Sahib, and now, of course, from Chandigarh, which only shows that wherever you go, you get elected, <laughs> not from one constituency. It shows your popularity. And he Being is a prolific writer. Uh, especially in the context of defense, in the context of international relations, 
Uh, I don't think in the Congress party there is anybody who is as prolific as him in, in subjects of this nature. So thank you very much, uh, okay. Prish, for being here. Sir. Vivek Kachu, again, um, a extremely distinguished diplomat, joined the service in 1975. And he is an expert in the area of this part of the world, namely Afghanistan, Iran, Myanmar, and all these areas. And he was our ambassador to Myanmar, Afghanistan, Thailand, if I'm right. And he was at that, at one point in time, hold, be, was the Joint Secretary of the Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan Division. So he is enormous knowledge. Um, uh, and of course, nowadays, uh, Vivek Ji, I keep reading you in the Indian Express. You're a contributor, and I read your articles with great, great interest. So thank you very much. I'm sure you're going to help us understand the problem. And of course, my old friend, most important, Pashwati, who is here with me. And uh, she's been uh, a friend for a long, long time. She's from Miranda House, across the road from St. Stephen's. And uh, you know, you should have been in politics because you were president of the Miranda House student body. I don't know why you joined the Foreign Service. You should have been in politics. You would have been a great success. She joined the Foreign Service in 1976. And she is a European expert in European affairs. If you want to know about anything about European affairs, go to Bhashwati Mukherjee. And she, you, I watch her on, uh, on TV channels. And in her distinguished career over 38 years, she has headed for the longest time ever the MEA's department specializing in European affairs from 1998 to 2004. And uh, she was uh, our permanent representative to UNESCO from 2004 to 2010. And before that, you were in the permanent mission to the United Nations and a six-year tenure as chief of staff to the United Nations Human Rights Commission. But her real interest lies in the forgotten children, uh, the cause that are very close to your heart. And uh, I'm sure that you, and of course, she's an author of two books, one of which I would like to name, Bengal and its Partition, an untold story, and the most recent, The Endangered and Their Root. So thank you very much, Pashwati. So let's open this discussion and start with you, Manish. What do you think is going to happen? Well, uh, things definitely do not look good. The fact is that uh, we have a large diaspora in Canada, you know, going back to 1896, when the first uh, migrations from Punjab took place which then picked up speed around 1906, a decade later. And uh, there is a very large Indian community, not only from Punjab, <coughs> but from across the country. Uh, and so therefore, this current turbulence in the relationship uh, unnecessarily uh, impacts not only Indo-Canadian relations, but this huge diaspora, which substantially is peace-loving, people who've got absorbed and assimilated into Canadian society, and like all immigrants, want a better life for themselves, a better life for their children. And so therefore, uh, this is, by all standards, uh, something very unprecedented. And the fact is that the Canadians, now going back all the way to the early 80s, have unfortunately not been sensitive to India's security concerns. Uh, this is not the first time the expulsion of diplomats has taken place from Canada, Indian diplomats. It happened in 1989 also. But this is the first time when you've had a prime minister personally make so much of a song and dance about it. And a lot of people are attributing it to the upcoming elections in Canada and the fact that the Trudeau administration is not doing too well. So, therefore, insofar as Canada is concerned, there is definitely a political angle to it, uh, which cannot be discounted. But insofar as the United States of America is concerned... But it's connected, no? It's a different ball game altogether because, unfortunately, the United States, you know, seems to have far, far more evidence which they have put out in the public space uh, which does not really augur well for us. And as the trials will play themselves out, and nobody knows this better than you, uh, there would be embarrassments uh, along the way. 
And so therefore, the challenge really is, you know, how do you insulate the greater relationship uh, between India and the US from the fallout of whatever is the legal processes which will play themselves out. And as in so far as Canada is concerned, well, at the moment, the relationship seems gutted. But it's true. But uh, incidentally, in this program, we don't ask questions. Anybody can intervene at any time. Vivek ji, I am a little more concerned because even if, um, you know, um, the Canadian relationship takes a downturn, Unfortunately for us, the evidence that is available in the United States even relates to the assassination of Niger. Uh, Kapil, you would know the validity of that uh, evidence far better than I would. Uh, I don't know whether that evidence, uh, the, which is in the indictment of, yes, yes. of Yadav, uh, would be admissible in a Canadian court of law. Uh, but certainly, uh, the Canadians seem to have no, at least, uh, no evidence which they presented to a court of law as yet. They have four boys, Indian boys, in their custody. Uh, they seem to be uh, of a criminal, quote unquote, I mean, yes. uh, allegedly, allegedly criminal uh, bent. Uh, the Canadians had them for some time, mm. but uh, they haven't, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the case hasn't proceeded against them. The, uh, it seems to me that uh, the Canadians diplomatically took a step which is totally unprecedented mm -hmm. in my experience, mm -hmm. calling an High Commissioner a person of interest mm -hmm. in a criminal matter. That's true. And then saying that we want to question you and lift him and ask India to lift his immunity. It's never done. Mm -hmm. It's simply not done. That's true. And Trudeau said in, uh, as much in his press conference that, well, if we were asked, we would also not do the same. So then why ask? So the relationship with Canada is uh, in a very difficult state. And the onus for this clearly lies on Canada. Besides, uh, the Canadians have been very sanctimonious. You know, they haven't given visas to Indian service personnel serving in Kashmir, mm. defense service personnel. They haven't given visas to Indian intelligence people who served in Canada a long time back in our mission and who have children, their families there. Uh, they seem to believe that they have the right to be intrusive Mm. That's not that's, that's not true. how the diplomatic game is played. Now, you've said, uh, you mentioned the American case, and I entirely agree with you. The American case is far dicier for us. Because but Vivek, there's an interconnection between the two, and that's what I'm worried about. As of today, I mean, you would know this better, but as of today, the Canadians are saying that we have evidence but they haven't produced that evidence publicly. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the Americans have produced. have produced it. They produced two indictments, which are there. And apparently, there are two sealed in That's indictments, right. which That's are true. also That's there. Correct, so we don't correct, know correct, what they correct, are. Correct. Now, there's, there's one thing which, which uh, uh, we're talking of sensitive things, but uh, we no, can talk No, we should, we should. Tom. You see, I, as far as the Americans are concerned, they were able to get hold of a person. Yes. He, uh, they got hold of him abroad. He was there for a year. They then extradited him. So they have him. And you would know this again, yes, of both course. of you being eminent lawyers. But that once you have that a person, then, he, then it's no longer hearsay. It's, it's evidence from him, at least of matters that he knows. The Canadians don't. My last point here would be that the Canadians strangely came to us and said, look, we have intelligence. Much of that was given to them by the, the, their five I allies. Yes, correct. That's, right? correct. That's correct. And they then asked us that please convert this intelligence into evidence. Yes. Now, who does that? Mm. No, no, of course, there's no question about doing that. But unfortunately, yeah. and this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, they have Nikhil Gupta. 
with them. They call yeah. them Nick, right? Yeah. There's an Indian official involved. There's an Indian, allegedly Indian official who belonged to the CRPF, right? And then was sent oh, on deputation. I'm sorry, originally, yes. Been sent on deputation. Well, uh, that's what the, I'm, I'm only saying what the allegation is. That allegation may be right, may be wrong. I'm not on that at the moment. That's the allegation. So therefore, and then there is a source which connects Nikhil Gupta with the official. And that source then is connected to the, uh, to the American uh, counterintelligence agent, right? Who is involved in all this. So there are these four players and there are conversations between them which are recorded record it and uh, in fact the alleged official who was urging Gupta to do the strike also talked about the strike in Canada which is why I'm bringing this up also talked about the strike in Canada and then at a later point in said and said look we want you to do that strike in Canada as well but then said no 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 we don't need you anymore we've done it ourselves Right? There is also a screenshot of him with certain officials who are in, in suits, which are with the Americans, which are part of the indictment. My worry is that even if the Canadians do not have that evidence, I'm worried that this is going to lead to a lot of embarrassment, which we don't like to avoid. And Vashwati, what is your take on it? I'd like to present this matter in a slightly different perspective. Let's go back to the downing of the Kanishka. Yes. Let's go back to the clear evidence produced by Canadian intelligence who investigated the case of those who were responsible and whom the Canadians refused to indict. Right. In Kanishka, there were a large number of Canadian citizens who died. 269. Yes. Absolutely. And the refusal unfortunately of Trudeau's father, so it seems to be a dynastic thing against India <laughs> in a way, uh, to go ahead with the indictment indicates a double standard that you pointed out in your presentation that while it's perfectly kosher to go after your enemies, whether crossing your borders or in a country far away, uh, as was done for Osama bin Laden as an example, right. it is not correct for smaller players like India to even think of doing the same because international law is sacrosanct in one way for the big boys and not so for the smaller boys who are trying to become big boys. That's the first, my first point. Secondly, when they named our High Commissioner, who's a professional diplomat of the highest integrity, Sanjay Varma, as a person of interest, it is very interesting what they later said he was supposed to have done. He was supposed to have continuously fed the Indian government along with the other Indian diplomats who were expelled with information about subversive activities being carried out by certain unfriendly persons of Indian origin and otherwise right. on Canadian soil against India. Correct. Well, I don't know about my colleague Ambassador Vivek Karju, but I have no hesitation in saying on your channel that I have done exactly the same thing as Ambassador of India to the Netherlands. I have That's your job. supplied to the government of the day who happened to be actually external affairs minister Salman Khurshid information about certain hostile elements sitting in the Netherlands plotting against the territorial integrity and sovereignty Absolutely. of India. I certainly supplied that information and I am sure that the Canadians or the Dutch or the British or the Americans or any other country who has an ambassador in India would have no hesitation in doing the same. Because we, we, that is our job as professional diplomats. That's the second point I wanted to make. Yes. The third point I wanted to make was, I am not worried at all about embarrassment because Prime Minister Trudeau under oath had to confess that he had intelligence but no evidence. And therefore, he actually validated our argument that if you have evidence presented to us, which he did not, as far as the American indictment is concerned, Americans are not perfect in their indictments. They have, for instance, kept illegally in a small little place off the shore of Cuba, a lot of persons allegedly involved in 9-11 who have never been given a fair trial 
not been given their rights, have been tortured, some have lost their mental stability and are still being held there. Under, their, under those circumstances, I would very much question the veracity of the American system of indictment and to say, as you two eminent lawyers sitting here, that their indictment, in my opinion, as a non-lawyer, doesn't sound good to me. Where is the hard evidence? And in any case, where is the evidence linking either of these two indictments with the state of India, with the government of India, with Indian diplomats or with the Indian intelligence services? How do we know that these are not rogue elements? In every, in every state, there are rogue elements. There could be rogue elements. They have rogue elements too. And what is even more disturbing <coughs> is information that came out yesterday that there was information intelligence fed to the Washington Post by the Canadians and the Washington Post was informed, please do not publish it until Mr. Trudeau and his foreign minister, who has been calling for sanctions to be posed against India, until they have finished their press conference. This is, in my perspective, very unethical behavior. And I would reiterate the fact that just as Bishop Desmond Tutu said that I will not eat crumbs thrown from the white man's table when he was suffering under apartheid, I would say as a professional Indian diplomat that I refuse that my country should be treated in any way inferior in international law to another just because our present GDP may be less than that country concerned. I would insist that international law is the same, in which case those who have committed extrajudicial killings in the past should come clean and they should apologize to those countries where those extrajudicial killings took place. They should express remorse and they should say that they violated international law. Why should they go after only one country without any evidence yeah. is the position that I would take. No, I think it's absolutely valid. I don't think that anybody can even defend what Canada did. I don't think anybody can say that the United States have been kosher on all these issues. They've done it in the past. I don't think that we can say that, look, the United States and the West doesn't have double standards. I think we're all agreed on that. And I don't think that the Canada had the business to name a high commissioner to say he's a person of interest for what is what diplomats do all over the world, as you rightly said. But the question that still arises, the fact of the matter is they are the powerful countries. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. No doubt. They have double standards. Yeah. They will use those double standards against us yeah. and they'll try and pressurize us. The question is, as far as your question on the evidence is concerned, I don't <laughs> think either I or anybody else should say at this stage whether the evidence is, 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 is trustworthy or not, but that's something that will actually pan out during the course of the trial. But what I have in the indictment in terms of telephone conversations uh, is quite damning. Uh, and to say the least, will embarrass us if it comes into the public domain. The question is, the United States needs us. We should leverage our affinity with the United States to say to them that this is not the route to take because we have a lot of common interests and this is not something that should be raised. We are, in fact, the only players in this part of the world which is now close to the West in our collective effort to ensure that the Chinese expansion in the Pacific Ocean and in the Indian Ocean doesn't extend to such an extent that we are made enemies of the West while we should in fact be permanent friends of the West. I, can I add something on yes. that? I'd just like to say that the fallout is already evident in the sense that there is a lot of public opinion in India which was doubtful of the utility of serving as the lone outpost of the West in taking on the Chinese in the Indo-Pacific, etc. If it's a non-reciprocal love affair, a love affair has to be reciprocal to be effective. Under those circumstances, marriage, this would push. Doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to. Be. <laughs> I right. agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the under those circumstances, those who were in favor of a more balanced approach, as far as the West vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China are concerned, are now speaking out saying that if this is the way India's closest so-called strategic partner, the United States, is embarrassing us on a daily basis publicly, 
then it makes sense for India to balance itself to go back a little backwards and maybe re-examine its ties with those countries with whom we were taking on for ourselves on one hand, I agree, but also as a close ally of the United States. So as I said, a love affair has to be reciprocal. I have nothing to say uh, about since marriage. Sir, there are some, I think, more fundamental issues which, uh, which are involved. You see, unfortunately, now going back all the way to India's independence, you have your intelligence structures which are not grounded in law. True. The Intelligence Bureau does no not have a legal architecture. No yeah. The RNAW does not have a legal architecture. Your NTRO does not have a legal architecture. And obviously there is no uh, independent external oversight. And in fact, now going back to 2011, this is the third time that I've moved a private member's bill. Yeah. whereby uh, I have been arguing that almost every democracy across the board uh, has its intelligence structures grounded in law, subject to external oversight. God forbid if you happen to get into a situation that we have got into, it would have been very easy for us to argue that, look, we have a very robust mechanism whereby we have our parliamentary institutions which exercise independent oversight on our agencies. Number two, they are grounded in a legal basis. So therefore, their mandates are very clearly defined in terms of what they can do and what they cannot do. Correct. The argument which is always extended against it, us, is that, oh, we live in a difficult neighborhood and so therefore there has to be operational flexibility, there has to be operational autonomy, you cannot have uh, parliament because politics is so polarized, actually watching over the intelligence structures, but politics is polarized in the United States of America also. Right. Politics is polarized all across Europe also. Politics is polarized in, in Asia also. So therefore, that is neither an argument here or there. <coughs> in fact, for government of India to be able to very strongly make its case that we are a responsible state, we do not indulge uh, in such actions. If at all, there is something which may have happened. At best, it could have been a rogue element and we have mechanisms to deal with it. Uh, it would have really strengthened our case. And so therefore, <coughs> de the hypocrisy of those who actually have been carrying out cross-border operations now going back uh, decades. Uh, the fact remains that uh, we are in a bit of a pickle. I think so. What do you say, Vivek? I'm a little confused with what Bhaskati said. First of all, uh, there are no love affairs, Bhaskati, you and I know between nations and states. Not it's even all, with Russia. It depends on interest. Except it's, 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 it's interest that govern. It has seemed to me that uh, over the past uh, decade or so, the government of the day decided uh, that our interests coincided more with the United States than with others, uh, than with, say, uh, Russia. And certainly, despite all the efforts at personal chemistry uh, with the Chinese, we had Galwan. Uh, today is an important meeting. Hopefully, things will improve. So is it now uh, the case being made for a rethink? And if so, is it your view that the government of the day went too far in its, in its seeking a coincidence of interest with the United States? Because if you're talking that uh, of love affairs and we can change, etc., then that is the drift of the argument that I'm getting, that we went too far and now we must withdraw. I think astute diplomacy demands that you don't go so far. And you'll agree with me, that you calibrate. So somewhere along the way, 
what you are pointing out is that that calibration got a little awry. I mean, that is the logic of what you've said. Let me respond if you permit. No, 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 sure. Uh, if you permit me, I'll just yeah. add something. When it comes to rogue elements, I have two problems. The first is that if in any government organization, and you've been in both of you, if there is a rogue element, it shows a failure of the administrative oversight of CMS. There are rogue elements, but it is it does constitute a failure because there shouldn't be rogue elements. So the rogue element argument is a very dicey one. It cuts both ways. The MEA spokesperson has said that Yadav is no longer a government employee. So no longer, but was. But was, of course. Yeah, yes. As uh, he was confirmed uh, as uh, in the aviation uh, research, center. research center. Correct. In November last. That's year. correct. And the government uh, said so before the central administrative Tribunal. Yes. So, uh, I know government works in silos and all the rest, but let's be very careful when we <coughs> use the rogue element argument, because it's not such a simple argument to sustain. It opens up uh, to scrutiny, both internally and externally. And we know that there have been various intelligence agencies in the past. We know we don't have to recount history. When they had put forward that, look, we've had these rogue elements for ideological reasons, etc., then the trust in them diminished very substantially. So if I may just respond to first your earlier uh, comment. I have, I never said that we went too far in our decision to ally with the West and the United States. I firmly believe that that was a correct decision given the hostile neighborhood and given the fact that we needed to strengthen infrastructure, strengthen our defense forces, needed access to critical American technology. We did the right thing in doing what we did. I am saying that it would now appear that the strategic partnership that both countries said was very important to their individual core national interests. I am disappointed that it appears to be in this particular case non-reciprocal because on a daily basis we are being embarrassed as a government, as a nation, as a people by selective leaks in the Washington Post, messages made, etc. It could very well be that the United States, which is going through a highly polarized presidential election, things may calm down once we know the results on 6th of November. As far as rogue elements are concerned, I just use the word perhaps. I never said there are rogue elements. There are rogue elements in the Western agencies and there are rogue elements in various agencies across the world. We have no evidence as of now whether there is a rogue element or not. As far as Mr. Yadav's family is concerned and Mr. Yadav himself, he has strenuously denied and he is entitled to a fair and free trial. He cannot be judged guilty until he's had a fair and free trial, etc. So I'm not saying he's a rogue element. I am saying that the possibility of a rogue element cannot be ever ruled out. That's all I've said. I've not said he's a rogue element. You know, there is, a, there is another dimension to it. You see, the thing is that we are presuming and presupposing that the U.S. administration is in some manner complicit in what is happening. Now, all of us are aware of the fact that the United States has a fiercely independent judiciary and they guard that independence uh, very zealously also. This is not something which came out of any U.S. Uh, government or U.S. administration inputs. The fact is that the person 
these gentlemen were allegedly interlocuting with happened to be a DA informer. Oh, it's an right? undercover, so, 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 undercover so, agent. So therefore, the, the, the train of circumstances which spun off, uh, I don't think was because of the US administration, but the, 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 the cause of it is definitely impacting uh, the, the relationship, relationship. In, a, in, in, a, in a negative way. So I think we, we need to be very careful because uh, the little that I understand the US system, even if the US administration would want to, for they the sake of a strategic relationship, uh, try and uh, do something, I don't think they will be able to do it. And what the US has been attempting to do, and both of you are very eminent diplomats, is to try and firewall the relationship from unfortunately what is playing out or what will play out in the judicial processes. In fact, there is a, it's, there's a far more serious issue to it. Let me tell you this. Let's now assume that this is a rogue element we, and that government of India is not involved and we like to believe that government of India is not involved. Now this rogue element in the name of Mr. Yadav contacts Nick Gupta, right? And uh, he tells Nick Gupta, as far as your cases are concerned, don't worry about it. Right? Everything is fine. Nothing will happen to you again. This is all recorded. Right? So, and then the fact of the matter is, why would a rogue element hand over $15,000 in cash, record it to somebody on his own? And I'll assume there are either somebody else who is also a rogue element behind him, of which we don't know, but there is something certainly working which ultimately resulted in all this. So we assume now government of India is not involved and we'd like to believe that. But the kind of indictment with the audio records and with the video would suggest that there were other people involved. Now who those other people involved are, we don't know. And if in fact, the gentleman belonged to the government of India service at that point in, at that point in time. The government of India should have known what his credentials were. Why did he have to con con connect with Nick Gupta? And uh, why should this rogue element be allowed to do all this? The, the problem is that uh, the, the policies of the government of India over the years, especially since 2014, have been somewhat proactive in many of these matters, and rightly so, because we don't want our security to be endangered by elements outside of this country, so we support that policy. But at the same time, if some rogue element is going to do a job like this, you should do it professionally. You shouldn't do it in a uh, ham-handed manner. Look, uh, I, for one, have enormous respect uh, for the Indian intelligence services. I think they play a vital role in the nation's uh, security and safety, and as diplomats, Vaspati and I have had the good fortune of interacting with them. And some of them are, they uh, contain, uh, they have among them some of the finest people you can think of. Uh, the question of oversight is a political question. I do know that in many countries there is oversight. Uh, and uh, perhaps a day will come when uh, we will have. We should. We should. We will have we oversight. Yes. What is uh, what will deeply concern me is that even though we live in a world of double standards, the first uh, attempt of any agency or uh, in, in, in the con or in diplomacy in the conduct of international affairs is plausible deniability. Paswati, you'll agree with me. There's one or one of diplomacy that you must conduct yourself in a manner that you don't expose it. Correct. And you never expose the country. Yes or the state to any embarrassment. Now, of course, the Americans have been embarrassed time and again. Gary Pass, 
he was shot down. He was put on trial yes. way back in, yeah. was it 60 or 61? Yeah. The U2 plane. And there have been other cases. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that uh, we say that, look, uh, this is part of the game. Either if that is the approach, that we'll say that, look, if this is part of the game. This is the way the international uh, system operates. Uh, then we will be embarking on a new policy. But we should have the clout to do that, to say that, you know, that's part of the game. Uh, I think, uh, Kapil, if you permit me to say, uh, countries have brazened it out. Big countries. No, no, big countries, yes. No, uh, uh, even, even uh, I, I do think that we have the capability of saying that, uh, uh, that we will, we, uh, that for our national security interests, we'll do what it takes. But you then can't have it both ways, right. in a plausible way. Yeah, that's the problem. You can't say that we are the world's largest democracy. We f respect fundamental rights and, and civil liberties and uh, we are a good international citizen. And then say this. So I think we've got to make fundamental choices. I for one do believe that national security sometimes demands we do what we have to do. That you do what you need to do. I mean, exactly. I, I, but that's the interest. But that's plausible deniability. Parthwati, you will agree with me. Should never I am be remembering 71. We did what had to be done. We used intelligence. We did what had to be done. We were given a certain time frame to liberate Dhaka. We did what it had to be done. So it's not as if in our path as an independent nation, we haven't done what had to be done. That's not the issue here. Here we are almost an emerged country. But we are con confronted by the hypocrisy of the developed West who try to sermonize and lecture us and try to hold us culpable without proof of breaking international law and embarking upon a policy of what they call extrajudicial killings when in their history they have done much, much worse. So I agree with you that international law should be the same for all. In the Cold War, if you remember, there was a famous case of a man who stood in a queue. He was a Bulgarian spy who killed somebody with the tip of a poisoned umbrella. I still remember I was in PMI New York at that time. Those were extrajudicial killings. Nobody lifted an eyebrow. We can't say that Bulgaria was a developed country. It was part of the rules of the game of the Cold War. But in India's case, we have not ever been accused of embarking on a policy of extrajudicial killings. But we have certainly, in our path as an independent nation, done what it takes to preserve our territorial integrity. In this particular case, for instance, I would like to make the distinction uh, to uh, my, my, my friend here, Mr. Tiwari, as he rightly pointed out, the bulk of the diaspora, Indian diaspora in Canada, does not support these fringe elements at all. I have a sister who lives in Vancouver. She's a Canadian citizen. She doesn't support it. So this fringe element is actually holding the Canadian Prime Minister to ransom. And in the process, the Canadian Prime Minister has, to quote him, gutted the India-Canadian relationship. My concern like the Americans is how to insulate the India-US strategic partnership, which is far more important as far as I'm concerned as a professional diplomat from the damage or the fallout of what Mr. Trudeau is doing. He's doing what it takes to remain in power. But the problem That's is the, the problem is the five eyes have supported him. Actually, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, whether well, it's Australia yeah. or it's New Zealand. Yeah, but Sibyl you, 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 you are aware. You've and, said. and you know, this argument of double standards can't win us the argument. 
<coughs> that's the that's the problem. You're right. There are but double we have standards. To remember it. But can that's yes, but can it win us the argument? It can, it will win us only when we have the economic and might of the Your United Bangladesh States. example is not quite at, you know appropriate in this context because there's a whole population in Pakistan, then East Pakistan. No, I was saying it in the context of yeah, when yeah, we did yeah, what yeah. it uh, is. But, but, but yeah, let me yeah. add something to what Bhaskar said. Uh, we need not go back to 1971. Okay. In 2019, after Balakot, we proclaimed a doctrine, what I believe was a doctrine of preemption. Yes. We said that if we see preparations being made for a terrorist attack uh, against India, we reserve the right, we reserve the right to take action which is needed to neutralize them. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. That is what we said. Right, you're right. Now, in Balakot, uh, we took action against terrorists centers and we immediately after that action we said that we were not attacking Pakistani state installations, we were attacking terrorist centers. Uh, now there again we were using conventional. Uh, this is a dilemma that we have faced on account of Pakistan which has acted in an abnormal manner all through. Now the question arises whether we will extend this doctrine. doctrine and how will we extend it outside Pakistan. Right. The Canadians say that all, and the Americans too, if you see what the Attorney General has said after the right. indictment right. was right. unsealed. Right. Right. Said, right. There is no difference between what the Americans are saying and, and what, what the Canadians are saying. Absolutely, right. that's it, what I was trying to show. Yeah, they, it was, it, it's identical what yes, they are saying. Yes. So uh, they say that, look, this is not kosher. Yes. Bhaswati is right when she says that uh, they've done the same thing yes. in, other, in other countries. But I do not recollect an instance where they've had to face an indictment in a foreign court. The last case that I recollect was in Pakistan. If you rec one of their contractors in yes. Lahore. Yes, Lahore. Yes, yes. Lahore. 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 Yes, yes. That's right. Uh, Shorter was, man. Was traveling in and uh, he was, uh, there, was, there was a chap on a, two boys on a motorcycle and I think uh, from his car he shot them and, and ultimately the Pakistanis lodged the case. Yes, yes. And uh, the Americans said he had diplomatic immunity. The Pakistanis proved that he had none. Uh, the matter was settled out, of, uh, settled in court through the payment of blood money, which is something which is part of their, their yes, legal system. system. Yes, yes. Apart from that, I do not know of any case where a matter has been taken to a court of law. Right like the Americans have done in this. This is the worry. So, uh, so you are right. They practice duplicity and we must condemn it. That's right. The same law must apply across the board to, to everyone. But you will agree with me, Vasudhi, that the circumstances of each case are different. And this, therefore, the approach has to be different. In this particular case, I'll just speak for one minute. Uh, I think Mr. Tiwari wanted to say something. In this particular case, what is more worrying is that the Canadian Prime Minister is complicit in a plot by a small fringe group to destabilize and fracture the Indian state while preaching that he believes in one India. He said it publicly that he believes in one India. But his actions give the impression that he would, he supports the state of Punjab seceding from the Union of India to become a separate and independent state run by elements who have withdrawn support from his government so that he does not have enough votes to pass his budget in February and therefore he's pandering to them even more 
so as to be able to stay on in power. That for me is far more worrying and the dilemma that that poses then is what should this great country of ours do to counter such threats now and in the future? So what Can they think? be done but, but, conventionally but, but, or but, extra but, 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 but Let me make two points. You see, even when Punjab was extremely disturbed between 1980 and 1995, there was not even 0.1% support for secession. Correct. In fact, uh, whatever may be the disposition of certain elements in Canada, it has no resonance in Punjab at all on for the me. ground. Right? So, therefore, uh, they live in their own eco chamber. Uh, they emigrated from India at a certain point in time when things were uh, turbulent. And so, therefore, their conception of what India is is unfortunately caught in that time wrap. We had largely ignored them over all these years. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, they had become virtually irrelevant. The fact is that by the unfortunate circumstances which have played uh, themselves out, you've made this fringe element which is not only confined to Canada, but to various other parts of the world unfortunately re-relevant for no rhyme or reason and that should be a cause of worry for us. My problem is that despite all this, despite what the Canadians have done, despite what Trudeau does, it's not going to solve the problem that we are facing. You, you, may, you may take any defenses you want of double standard or anything, the reality on the ground is that there is an indictment, there is evidence, there are conversations, there are videos, how are you going to deal with it? Either you, the best way to deal with it is to talk to the Americans and say, let's resolve this issue. How to do that, that's really a problem. Well, my problem. experience has been that uh, but whatsoever. But Mr. Tiwari has mentioned it's not possible. No, because no. Of the I, I, have a slightly, no, no, no. I have a slightly different no, no. take on this. Mm -hmm. Based on some experience, not so much with the Americans, but with uh, the European circle. Whatever they may say of judicial independence, yeah, etc., yeah, yeah, exactly. when push comes to shove, yes, exactly. it all melts. Remember the Italian? The I problem with the you, Italian and the fishermen, and the fishermen the on our coast, what happened? There is a big difference between the European judicial system and the American judicial system. So, uh, uh, I have to say that Mr. Tiwari has a very valid point when he says that it's a fiercely independent system. But, it's also a system that is pragmatic and there can always be discussions on how to insulate the partnership, strategic partnership, so as not to push us into another direction. That is very true. In this particular case, I am convinced that there has been no wrongdoing on our part. I believe that it's being blown out of proportion because of the Canadian domestic politics. I do agree that it is very worrying that the Americans have got into it in such a big way with the indictment because they have a, a vigorous uh, legal system. But I am sure that it, it is manageable till to now. It can still be Which managed. Which one? The American or the, the Canadian? Not, not the Canadian. I am not, not worried about, about the, the Canadian. The Canadian cannot be it's managed. The fallout the of the American one. trial is going to be on the issue of the, uh, the, of the assassination that, there, of Niger. There, I will have to this naturally is, uh, this is a problem. This is, I'm telling you, a real problem. It's a real right? problem. It is, it will have, therefore, therefore is what that, will that be, that, uh, that indictment or the, what, what is said in an American court of law, that would that be admissible in a court? Whether it's court? admissible or not no, admissible, no, it's, it's not a huge, no, I don't no, that's not, that's not be too I'm sure. There's a huge embarrassment internationally for us. You must understand, when this comes to light, it creates a problem within the country. It creates a problem outside the country. And it creates a, a problem in our relationships with the most important partner of the, uh, that we have today. So let's sort of end this discussion by saying nobody can be convinced on what really is on the ground. We'll see what happens. But I think that our country should stand together to make sure that we are all together in this and somehow use our diplomatic skills to resolve this issue. And if you permit me to add one sentence. Uh, we should remain proud of our intelligence. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you very much, you very much. for this absolutely wonderful conversation.